Good evening, afternoon, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we're going to review the brain. Now, this video has a ton of information in it, so make sure you take out my guided notes and pause the video if you need more time to write things down. All right, so it's no secret that the brain is one of the most important organs in the body. It contains over 86 billion neurons, more than 100,000 miles of axons, over 10 trillion synapses, and consumes more than 20% of the body's oxygen. The brain is simply amazing. One aspect of the brain that truly stands out is brain plasticity, which is the brain's ability to change and adapt even after it's injured. Essentially, brain plasticity is the brain's ability to rewire itself, form new neural connections, or strengthen existing ones. This is what helps the brain learn new skills, recover from damage, or adjust to new experiences. Now, the brain is part of the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord. At the base of the brain, we have the brain stem, which includes the medulla oblique the pons, and the midbrain. The brainstem connects the brain to the spinal cord, which transmits messages between the brain and the rest of the body. You can think of the spinal cord as an information highway. This is how messages travel between your brain and your body. Now, the medulla controls autonomic functions like our heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, and digestion, things that we don't consciously think about. The medulla is located just above the spinal cord and below the pons. Speaking of the pons, this is what connects different parts of the nervous system, especially the cerebellum and the cerebrum. It plays an important role in sleep and dreaming, particularly in regulating REM sleep, which we'll talk more about in our next video. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. To help remember the pons, think of it as a pillow that's located on top of the bed, which is the brainstem. Now I mentioned the cerebellum. This is a structure that's located at the base of the brain in the back. This is what controls muscle movement, balance, and some forms of procedural learning, which is a type of long-term memory that involves learning how to perform tasks or actions through repetition and practice, often without conscious awareness, such as riding a bike or playing an instrument. Now, the word cerebellum means little brain in Latin, and it's referring to its two wrinkled hemispheres that resemble a smaller version of the brain. Damage to the cerebellum can lead to uncoordinated or clumsy movements, similar to the behaviors of someone who is intoxicated and cannot walk a straight line. So overall, the cerebellum helps you stay balanced and coordinated while managing your motor control. Now, the next structure we're going to talk about is the reticular activating system, which is a bundle of nerves that run through the brainstem. This system plays a key role in regulating arousal and consciousness. It helps control your sleep-wake cycle and general alertness. One part of the reticular activating system that I want to highlight is the network of neurons that extend from the brainstem up to the thalamus and other areas of the brain. These neurons are what help filter incoming sensory information and alert the brain to important signals, like when your name is being called in a noisy room or when something dangerous suddenly happens. You can remember it by thinking of RAS as the rise and shine. It helps you wake up and pay attention. Now, before we move on to the limbic system, I want to quickly mention the brain's reward center. Now, the good news for AP Psychology is you don't need to memorize the names of all of the different brain structures that are involved with the reward center. Instead, just remember that the reward center is what makes an individual feel satisfaction or pleasure. For instance, winning in a game or spending time with family and friends. The reward system uses neurotransmitters, especially dopamine, to create a feeling of reward. This helps reinforce behaviors and mental processes that are important or motivating for the individual. We'll talk more about motivation and the impact of rewards later in this class. Now, located between the brainstem and the cerebral cortex is the limbic system. This includes structures such as the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The limbic system plays a major role in emotion, memory, learning, and motivation. We can see that the thalamus is what receives sensory information. Well, everything except for smell. Once it receives the information, it then sends that information to the right areas of the brain. For instance, if you hear a sound, the thalamus sends that information to the auditory cortex to be interpreted. You can think of the thalamus as the brain sensory relay station. Up next, there is the hypothalamus, which helps maintain homeostasis. This is what controls our hunger, thirst, or the body's temperature and sexual behavior. The hypothalamus also helps regulate the endocrine system by signaling the pituitary gland, which, speaking of the pituitary gland, remember 
remember, this gland is also known as the master gland, since it releases hormones that affect growth, our metabolism, and the other glands throughout the body. Then there is the hippocampus, which plays a key role in forming new long-term memories, especially explicit memories, which we will talk more about in Unit 2 when we explore memory. Now, one thing to remember with the hippocampus is that while it does help with forming memories, it does not store memories. Lastly, with the limbic system, there is the amygdala, which is involved in emotion, especially fear and aggression. This is what helps you respond emotionally to intense situations and form emotional memories. All right, so that is the limbic system. Now, up next, we have the cerebral cortex, which is the outer layer of the brain. The cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres and is made up of four main lobes, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes. These lobes are responsible for higher order thinking, sensory processing, decision making, and voluntary movement. As I mentioned earlier, the cerebral cortex is split into a right and left hemisphere. These hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum, a thick band of neural fibers that actually allow the left and right side of the brain to communicate with each other. All right, so I realize that this video is going fast and we've already covered a lot of information. But before we go and break down each of the different lobes, I wanted to remind you that if you need extra help with the brain, you can check out my ultimate review packet. I created a brain structure cheat sheet to help you you understand all of the different structures of the brain. Plus, I added some practice quizzes in there with explanations showing you why each answer is either right or wrong. That way you can truly master these concepts. All right, let's start reviewing the different lobes, starting out with the occipital lobes, which are located in the back of the brain. The occipital lobes process visual information. Everything that you see gets interpreted here. If we move forward through the brain, we have the next lobe, which is the temporal lobes. These are located just above our ears. The main job of the temporal lobes is to process sounds and help with language comprehension. So while you're listening to this video, your temporal lobes are helping you understand the words that I am saying. One important area of the temporal lobe that I want to highlight is Wernicke's area, which is responsible for language and comprehension. If Wernicke's area is damaged, a person may lose the ability to produce meaningful speech. They may still speak in full sentences or phrases, but the words often don't make sense. The individual may also have difficulty comprehending spoken language. This condition is known as Wernicke's aphasia. Now up next we have the parietal lobes, which are located near the top and back part of the brain. These lobes have two major functions. First, there is association areas, which are regions that help your brain organize and make sense of information. This is where information from different senses is brought together, which allows you to make sense of the world in a more complete way. Then there is the somatosensory cortex, which is part of the parietal lobes. This is what processes touch, pressure, pain, and temperature from the body. This allows you to have a better understanding of where your body is in space. So when you feel something touching your skin or when you know that your hand is holding a phone, your parietal lobes are helping you interpret that information. Now also remember that when it comes to interpreting your senses, you can't forget about contralateral organization, which refers to the way that the brain is set up. Each hemisphere controls the opposite side of the body, which I realize can be confusing. Just remember that the left hemisphere of the brain can controls the right side of the body while the right hemisphere of the brain controls the left side of the body. For instance, if you touch something with your left hand, that sensory information is processed in your right somasensory cortex. Speaking of sensory information, we can actually visualize the amount of brain area that is dedicated towards specific body parts when looking at the sensory homunculus. This diagram shows that areas like the hands and lips take up more space in the somasensory cortex because they are more sensitive than other parts of the body. Now, the last lobes that we need to review are the frontal lobes, which are located just behind your forehead. These lobes are responsible for higher level thinking and executive functioning. The frontal lobes help you produce and organize speech, plan and solve problems, manage decision-making tasks, your attention, and also your impulse control. Two parts of the frontal lobes that I want to highlight is the prefrontal cortex and the motor cortex. The prefrontal cortex is involved in judgment, planning, foresight, 
insight, attention, and complex thought. Basically, it's where much of your executive functioning happens. The prefrontal cortex is one of the last areas of the brain to fully develop, often not reaching full maturity until the individual is in their mid-20s. Now, the motor cortex, on the other hand, is located in the back of the frontal lobes. This is what controls your voluntary muscle movements. So when you choose to move your arm, legs, or other body parts, it's the motor cortex that's sending those signals. Remember, just like with the somosensory cortex, the motor cortex is contralaterally organized, meaning that the left motor cortex controls the right side of the body and the right motor cortex controls the left side. We can visualize the brain's control over our movement using the motor homunculus, a diagram that shows how much space in the motor cortex is devoted to each body part. More sensitive or complex areas like your hand and face take up more space than less precise areas like your back. Now, one last part of the frontal lobes that I want to highlight is Broca's area, which is involved in speech production. This is what helps coordinate the muscle movements needed to speak, especially those related to the mouth, lips, and tongue. If Broca's area is ever damaged, the individual may experience Broca's aphasia, a condition where the person struggles to produce speech. The individual will often know what they want to say, but have difficulty forming complete sentences. Now make sure you don't mix up Broca's area with Wernicke's area, which is involved in understanding language, but not producing it. All right, so those are the structures of the brain that you want to be familiar with for AP Psychology. Don't forget, if you need more help, you can check out my Brain Structures Cheat Sheet and take my Brain Structures Practice Quiz inside the Ultimate Review Packet for more help. All right, now I know we've covered a lot of information so far, but make sure you keep following along in your guided notes and pause the video if you need more time. We're gonna shift gears now and talk about brain research. All right, let's start with a case study with Phineas Gage, a railroad worker who was injured in a famous accident when a tamponing rod shot completely through his skull. Amazingly though, Gage survived the injury and remained conscious, even walking away from the incident shortly after. Now, while he did survive and he was able to talk, Phineas Gage did have some pretty severe personality changes. And it was discovered that it was because the rod had severed his limbic system and his prefrontal cortex was damaged. Remember, these areas are important for judgment and emotional regulation. Case studies such as the case of Phineas Gage showed us that the brain has different areas and hemispheres that have have unique and specialized functions. Our understanding of the brain was further enhanced thanks to split brain research, which is a procedure that was done to help treat people with severe epilepsy. It involves cutting the corpus callosum, which is what connects the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Once the corpus callosum is cut, the right and left hemisphere can no longer communicate. Patients who have had the split brain procedure done saw no impact or change on their personality or intelligence. This research has allowed us to better understand understand the different functions of each hemisphere. Researchers test for cortical specialization in split brain patients by using a clever trick. They show different information to each visual field, either the left or the right. Now, cortical specialization refers to the idea that different areas of the brain's cortex are specialized to perform specific functions. What researchers found is that when patients were shown a word in their right visual field, the patient was able to say the word without any problem. But when the words were shown to the left visual field, the patient would say they did not see anything. However, even though individuals said they saw nothing, they could still draw the word with their left hand. Once they drew the word, they could then identify it because their right visual field would see the picture that they drew. And this research supports the idea that the left hemisphere specializes in language, where structures like Broca's area and Wernicke's area are located, while the right hemisphere handles more visual, spatial, and nonverbal tasks. Again, we can also see the brain's contralateral organization at work here, which remember means that each hemisphere controls and receives input from the opposite side of the body. Now, two other ways in which we have gained insight into different functions of the brain is with lesion studies and autopsies. Lesion studies are where doctors and researchers will destroy specific parts of the brain to gain insight into the different functions of the brain. Today, this can be done to try and treat specific disorders. Autopsies, on the other hand, is an examination of an individual's body who has died to discover the cause of death. 
This often allows for individuals to better understand the extent of a disease, help determine the exact cause of death, and can also help provide important information for an individual's next of kin. Now, when it comes to observing brain activity, researchers and doctors use different imaging techniques. For AP Psychology, you want to be familiar with two techniques. The first is an EEG, which measures electrical activity in the brain by placing electrodes on an individual's scalp. This allows researchers to record electrical signals from neurons firing, which can help with sleep studies or seizure research. The other technique you want to be familiar with is an fMRI, which shows which areas of the brain are active by measuring changes in blood flow. All right, so there you have it. I know there was a ton of stuff that we talked about with the brain, but now comes the time to practice what we've learned. Don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet for more help on any of the concepts in this course. And if you found value in this video, consider subscribing. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sint, and I'll see you next time online.